Having said that though, our designers have designed this in such a way that it is a very competitive machine. You get a lot of value for money and it's not really a lot of difference in price than other lesser machines on the market. Hello and welcome to another MTD podcast. Uh, this one's being uh, filmed here at Nikon's Innovation Centre in Rotherham. I'm with two gentlemen, Lee Scott and Tom Skabula. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Um, now, we've been here for a couple of days. Uh, the purpose of our visit has been to um, interrogate the technology that is behind me from Hecker. Interrogate's the right word, is it, would you say? Yeah, we've broken it down into bite-sized chunks. We have done exactly that. And coming to our YouTube channel uh, and the MTD CNC app and our website and all of our platforms in the near future will be a series of videos all about the compact range from Hecker. Um, now, uh, we'll talk about all of the points that are covered on that series of videos during this podcast. It's going to last around about 30 to 40 minutes, but it's going to be packed with um, insights into what is on this machine, what it's equipped with, and why you should consider it um, to be in your machine shop. Um, so firstly, uh, Lee Scott, for, for people that don't know, perhaps you could just introduce yourself to our audience and tell us who you are and what you do um, as part of the Starag group. Yeah, sure. Well, we're talking about Hecate today. So Hecate is part of the Starag group. It's a brand that's designed and built over in Chemnitz. In Before we do that, what about you? I want to know about you. Tell our audience who you are. What about me? Sorry. Yeah. sorry for the, for those that have never seen you before, well, I know I'm you've been on all of, uh, loads of videos <laughs> with us in the past, Lee, but I want to know about you and, uh, yeah. Okay, well, I'm, I'm Lee Scott. I'm Director for Sales and Applications for UK. Um, and I've been with Starring now for 13 years, so I've seen a lot of growth, a lot of changes, a lot of innovation, and a lot of new products, which is what we're, of course, talking about today. Okay, good. Right, now, so tell us, give us a brief on the compact range. So, so the compact range is... Well, give us a brief on Hecate, actually, in general, because okay, I know... Well, if, if we start with Hecate, I mean, he Hecate is a, as I say, it's a German company, uh, machines built over in Chemnitz, um, and Hecate is part of the Starag Group. So what we do with Hecate is we build uh, horizontal machining centres, mill term machines, um, ranging from 400 millimetre pallet size up to 1.8 metres. So parts, if you like, from as big as your fist to anything that will fit within a 3.4 metre diameter swing on, on, on the machine. And we, we, we specialise in, in solutions for industries like aerospace and energy, transport and industrial type markets. Okay, now um, Tom, you've been with us for the last two days looking at this machine. Um, coming from the machine uh, from the shop floor, have you ever operated or used a machine of this ilk? No, but I wish I had because uh, there's some points which we'll cover on this machine which could make a li your life so easy as a machinist. Yeah, and and give you the ability to get parts off of the machine and through the machine shop a lot faster, which I suppose is is key isn't it to any machine shop these days oh definitely yeah it, this is a really quick rigid machine with great accuracy so there'd be no worries on what parts you could put through it because you could put anything through it to be honest yeah well we'll cover all that now now we've got actually 12 points that we're going to touch on um today we're going to talk about the uh the compact machine itself and the the options available with the machine we're going to talk about the spindle technology on the machine we're going to talk about four axis um, horizontal machines because this is a horizontal five axis machine we're going to talk about four axis versus five axis why you should select either or uh, one or the other we're going to talk about what impact speed power and accuracy has for a, um, a company and and what this can deliver in those areas we're going to talk about work holding on the machine we're going to talk about um, process integration so we know that this is a, a highly capable machine but what else do you need to keep process security we'll talk about the options on automation pallet changes uh, gantry loaders we'll also talk about the HMI um, how that can support or help uh, machinists be able to operate the machine very effectively not just from a machining perspective but from maintenance and all of all of the rest of it and we'll talk about keeping spindles turning really what this is about so um, Lee give our our listeners and our, our viewers just a quick overview of the compact range and why it has been introduced it's been introduced as, as, as an output from questions we asked our existing customers you know, what what could we do better 
in the, in, in the future. So one big thing was footprint. You know, we need to reduce footprint. We need to get more spindles per square meter into a factory. Um, so whether it's standalone or whether it's linked into a, an automation system or cell, you know, that, that, that was a big, um, a big objective. Uh, increasing performance and speed um, and, and, and widening the range of options. Um, but ultimately, it's all about reducing the cost per component for customers, whether they be steel, hard metal like titanium or ink canal, or even light alloy. So it's all about profitability for our customer base. Okay, let's cover one thing off um, here quickly at the start, because part of our um, the purpose of this mini-series of videos we've created is to talk about the affordability of these machines. And it's no secret, you know, a, a lot of our viewers will think, you know, this, this, this wonderful machine behind us is out of their league or out of their reach. Um, but it's not, is it? Well, I think this is a massive um, misunderstanding in the market about Starag. And I speak to a lot of customers, a lot of potential customers, people at trade shows. And the perception of Starag is we are very high end, very advanced, very high tech, very expensive. And... You know, people just don't phone us up when they're buying a horizontal machining centre because they don't think we're into that um, competitive arena like, like other mainstream names, if you like. And would you uh, have associated this machine, Tom, with uh, coming from the shop floor with, with, uh, in the company that you work for? Would it have been something, do you think, that you guys would have looked at or would you have thought what Lee's just saying? You know, the, these machines aren't for the subcontract machine shop. Would that have been an opinion of yours? Well, until until yesterday and actually speaking with Lee, yes, it was. I always thought Starag was for, obviously, your, your big guys, your little machine shops. They, they just price well out your range. Mm. And I've always thought that, to be honest, until actually speaking with Lee and talking about this machine. And to be fair, they are, they are a really affordable machine, which I think... It, it is out there that everyone goes, oh, we need a new machine. What about, can't afford a Starag? We'll not even, we'll not even inquire about one because what's They're the point? out straight away. Exactly. And out. I think, yeah. like Lee was saying, I think that's one of the problems where people just see Starag as, as this machine where we, we, we can't afford one. <laughs> where now, I think with this, obviously with this range as well, people just need to give them a ring because <laughs> They're a lot more affordable than people think. Yeah, and um, and that is a good point. Uh, if you want to contact Starek, we'll put Starek, We'll put the details on the screen. You can contact Lee uh, or his colleagues to find out more about the compact range um, after you've finished watching and listening to this podcast. Now, one of the first topics on this machine is probably one of the most important aspects of a machine is um, we're going to talk about the spindles and we're going to talk about the spindle technology that you offer. Before we go into detail about what the options are and some of the features on your spindles, why is the spindle so important, Lee? Well, we, we, we relate to a term called the, t the, the, the tool chip interface, and, and that, that's obviously where the, the tooth of the cutter is in contact with your workpiece. So it's all about productivity, and it's all about the behaviour of that cutting process on a... On a, on a given range of materials or, or a given type of material. So assuming you've got the right cutting tool and you've got the right tool holder uh, selected, the, 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 we start, our, our interface is, is, is the spindle. So it's really important that we have the correct size of spindle, we have the correct um, power torque for a specific given material or a range of materials. and. By doing that, if we optimise um, the capability of, of, of the cutting process, we produce parts faster. So there is plenty of options with your spindles, though, isn't there? So talk to us about speed, torque, uh, and where they fit. Because is there is there a, is there a one size fits all? And we don't have to get into the nitty gritty about ten thousand, twelve thousand, twenty thousand, because we we know there's a plethora of of speeds that you can you can offer. But what I'm really intrigued to um, understand is what you would offer to let's say the market that we've been discussing the subcontract market that c can afford these machines quite clearly they might be having a, a job that comes in one day that's a, a piece of titanium and the next day uh, you know an aluminium so is there a one size fits all from from that perspective because i know you've got high torques and you've got high speeds but wh where's that sweet spot in between 
there's no such thing as a one size fits all across such a wide range of materials. I think what we do that's different, nobody comes to us and says, I want a price and delivery for a machine and, and, and just give it me on a piece of paper. We always say to people, show us what you're trying to make, show us the materials you're cutting, the range of parts, the size of parts, and then we try and advise, and we start with the spindle. So that there's um, a range of uh, motor spindles from 10,000 up to 30,000 revs. You know, a 20,000 rev spindle for us for an automotive type application goes from zero to 20,000 and back within a second. So these, these are the kind of things we need to understand. Gear spindles range from six to 12 and a half up to over 2,000 newton meters of torque. Um, then we have a, a DBF spindle where we've got a U-axis actually on the spindle. So for oil and gas or valve type parts, we can overturn, turn, face, um, put a gramophone finish on a part w without using that, uh, bolted on out facing heads. And then we've got quill type spindles, horizontally mounted or on a, on a nodding head, swivel head type configuration. So you have to start with the component, how are you gonna cut the component, shortest reach tools, most rigid setup, and define the right spindle. So if you wanted to cut aluminium and titanium, yeah, we do have a solution, but it's not 30,000 revs for aluminium. It, it's a slower slower spindle, still reasonably fast. I think uh, if you went for a HSK 100 size, for example, we could offer an 18,000 rev spindle that's still got high torque for titanium. Mm. So. It's, it's, it's a compromise. Well, that, I mean, that's the, 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 the breadth of the offering on the spindles. But some of the things that come as standard and um, from a shop floor perspective, Tom, you've got we, these guys on, on their machines have got the ability to sense vibration in the spindle. So you can quickly establish whether you're getting the best tool life out of your tool or the machine will uh, make you aware if there's any Im imbalances. Um, you've also got, uh, is it water-cooled spindles on your machine you've got so many aspects to what comes as standard which enable you to get the best out of a, a spindle i mean have you ever worked with things like that tom and, and would you see an advantage to being able to extract information from what's happening in there to make sure you get um better parts and uh better economics on on other accessories around the machine see we had we had a machine with um, with spindle cooling so we've been i've, I've been down that road before but having a machine that can see vibration in a part before you can because let's be honest sometimes if you're doing the back of a part you can't see it all you're doing is listening you're trying to hear but if you're in a machine shop with 10 12 other machines running sometimes it's hard mm. so if you if your machine and you listen can, to your music and all that well, sort exactly, of stuff yeah, you know, if yeah. you've got radio on and uh, <laughs> but if, you, if your machine's already relaying that back to you then you can instead of instead of sometimes you'll do one part and go well that's scrap because it's all vibrated down the back but i couldn't hear it the, with the th with some of the features this machine's got your scrap rate could be lower as well and there's just another point i'd like to i'd like to with the stag machine is obviously sometimes you you think of a spindle as your smaller machines will have a smaller spindle and then your spindle will get bigger as as your machine gets bigger as you'd expect but with with some of your machines you can have a hk100 on your smaller machines which obviously other people don't do that so some you, you think oh you've only got a small machine you're doing small work yes but there's, there's some still people small will... parts made out of awful material yeah some, so, some people will buy a massive machine to to machine because they think they can because it's capable of machining small parts more effectively, but this having an HSK 100 on a 400 pallet is something that's pretty unheard of, I think, in the yeah, market. Yeah, because isn't it? What, some, like you said, some people buy a bigger machine than they need mm. just because they need the spindle, but then you've got a meter bed and you're using 200 mil of it at the end. You're just wasting a big machine. You're wasting all the movement. If you, your your machine's got to move a lot more it's, it's a lot heavier it's got to move. so if you can get a smaller machine but with the spindle you require yeah. why, why wouldn't you go down that road yeah absolutely um lee let's we I'm, I'm conscious of time here so is there anything you want to add in about the spindles before we move on to um the next subject i no. mean there's, there's going to be plenty coming on the series of videos that we've shot but 
Um, the, the only thing I would add to it is, is, and I was guilty of this when I was in the manufacturing end of the market rather than the machine tool end of the market, you take it for granted. You get a catalogue, you get a brochure, you get an email. It's a spindle. It's not a spindle. It's a very, very important part of the machine and you should understand what is required from the spindle and make sure you get the right spindle. And there's lots of technology, like you say, vibration sensors, water-cooled, long-life greasing systems, etc., etc. They're there for a reason. Yeah, yeah. OK, right, let's move on to um, four and five axis. Uh, a point we, we often talk about uh, on our videos is the fact that people don't adopt the four axis horizontal solution enough they they go for a five axis because they think that they need five axis when um they might not need it uh you know and you see a lot of these machines are going in around the world from starag that are just four axis aren't they for sure and and, and it's uh it's a strange thing for us in the uk we always get asked for five axis. Everybody wants five axis. You know, Joe Bloggs up the road's got a five axis. I want a five axis. Around the world, we sell many, many four axis machines, particularly for production parts that are four axis parts. So if you don't need a five axis, why buy a five axis? Unless you really want to future proof your business and you, you don't know what's going to happen around the corner. So, um, so I don't know why we don't sell many four axis machines in the UK compared to our. Uh, overseas colleagues but um but, but the, the compact range is designed to be either a four or a five axis range and let's let's talk about the um the five axis build here or let's talk about the bridge the table because these are important parts of a you know every machine tool from the, from the foundation up is built in a way and has a purpose to deliver parts in a in a faster way or in a quality um or a better quality product tell us about how this is built lee and some of the points you would like our audience to know as to why this configuration of, of machine should be considered and why it stands out well the, the way the machines are built you've, you've got a single monoblock base if you like with a column sat on it with a spindle in the column so a horizontal spindle and then the table groups like a bridge as you said it's it's it's, it's a bridge with two wide uh, guide rails and um, measuring systems on each side. So on, on the top of that bridge, we, we then house a, either a single, a single B-axis table for a four-axis machine, or we put a trunnion, a very heavy-duty trunnion, on the top to make the five-axis machine. So that's the way, we, that's the, way the machine's constructed. Mm. Um, and that table itself, it's kind of, if you drew a line down the middle of it, it's the same on the left as it is to the right, isn't it? It's, it's identical. Really important point, because not many people do this. A lot of people hang a table from one side, um, or, the, or they'll, they'll have a, a trunnion-type table, but they'll have a big drive at one side and a small bearing and almost like a centre at, at the other side. So ours is fully thermosymmetrical. So if you look straight down the machine at the spindle and you look at the table, it's equal both sides. Large bearings both sides, large brakes both sides. So it's a very rigid, balanced system. Mm, I suppose... Uh better for from a wear perspective on the machine isn't it and and mechanically would seem to be a, a better way to build it i mean there's less stress if you're driving a table from one side all the stresses are on one side aren't they as opposed to balancing that out from left to right sure i mean it it, it just makes sense in every way isn't it? You, wouldn't, you wouldn't have a car with a, a wide tire on one side and a motorbike wheel on the other would you it's just it's just not right i don't want to tell unbalanced. you about what's been happening with my tires lately <laughs> but that's another story um tom four axis machines you've been using vertical machining centers have you ever used a horizontal before no what, I... what would attract you to using one can you can you have seen and i think this is a really important point in amongst everything we're talking about here is the adoption of this style of machine from let's say a vertical machining center plenty of machine shops might have four five six ten vmcs and and you were working in one where there was a lot of vmcs to me you would have to move those parts a lot around the shop or you might have a a, a fourth axis unit or something where, where's the comparisons you would make to a horizontal versus those type of um, solutions See, because there's a place for both. I 100% get it, and I'm not saying one's I, better than another. But I think, like you say, I think there's a I think there's a place for both. Um, I used four axis quite a bit. I never, I never got the jump to five axis because we never needed one. Um, but like you said, I think there's a place for both because obviously, if you're doing, if you're doing one-offs and you're in the machine a lot, that's where I think your vertical comes in. But then, with the horizontal, you get a lot better chip evacuation. 
and you can just hit it from more places. Mm. So, you and can, you can stack up, can't you? You can. You, it doesn't have to always be the same part. Let's get away from this 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 thinking process that this machine is all about. 200 of these you know it, it's not is it you could you could have a tombstone where you've got a set of parts on one face and set of parts on another face four different components or different operations well that's it and i think i think that that's another another thing that comes back to the argument on why would you take a five axis over a four axis i think sometimes fourth axis gets overlooked a little bit because with four with fourth axis obviously you need i think and I might be wrong, but I think fourth axis comes down on what you work holding. Where with your five axis, it's it's not as critical because obviously you can hit more sides mm. straight from the get go. So, but the more times you move that part around a well, exactly. machine shop, the more risk you're introducing. So, aren't but, you? and I think I think there's a place for both, mm. and and also I think we're obviously, I, as Lee was saying, fourth axis is coming up, coming in a lot at the moment is. Because people are just realising you can actually do a lot more with a fourth axis than people ever realised. Mm. If you've got the right work holding, you can you can actually complete a part. And obviously now with the um, with some of the with some of the softwares out there where you can tap things off, you can you can you can do parts in one. But then obviously when you've got the five axis, you can do that anyway because you can just hit more sides. So I think that all comes down to to product, what you're doing, what you're making. Mm. But then, like going back to the horizontal, I think the horizontal is, is is another thing that's really overlooked. Like even for job shops, I think I think horizontal's overlooked because sometimes at a, a job shop, it's not it's not all the one minute, two minute program. You can still have you can still have it on the machine for three, four, five hours. And I think with having a horizontal, it's great because with that chip evacuation, like you said, you get better tool life because you're not cutting its own chips. Um, and yeah, I think I think horizontal really does need more adoption. It, it, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, just to, just to update you, if you've just uh, you've, you've stumbled across this on YouTube or wherever you're watching, there is going to be a series of videos on the MTD CNC website that go into real detail with Lee about uh, all of the points that we're discussing here on the uh, new compact range from Hecate. Now we're actually shooting this from the Nikon Innovation Centre in Rotherham. This is a fabulous place, uh, a really great place to come to witness machinery like this in action. Um, now we're going to talk about speed, power and accuracy and we're going to try and move uh, through these topics maybe a little bit quicker. So I, I, um, yeah, we, we're now 25 minutes into this podcast and we're going to try and get things wrapped up by about 40 minutes. So speed, power and accuracy, um, Lee, what does that mean and why have we picked that subject? It means profit. That's what it means. Because at the end of the day, if you buy a machine, you're buying a machine because you want to manufacture a specific component or range of components. So the faster you make them, the more accurate they come off the machine and reliably accurate, so non-conformance, no scrap. Obviously, you're not losing money that way. And, and the power goes hand in hand with the speed. The, the more speed and power you've got, the faster you can produce parts. It's as simple as that. Um, I said to you yesterday when we were uh, filming, I said to you, OK, I know what people will say. I've been in machine shops and people will say that machine looked really quick it could make my part in 50% of the time but then I'm going to run out of work and I've got nothing else to put on it so I've got a machine that's idle um, what's the point? Well You're a win, salesman, what do you say to that? Win some more work I mean this machine will win work for companies and, and it is 50% faster or more in, in many cases. I mean, we, we do time studies for people and we did one recently. We were 20% of the customer's time. They didn't believe us. We cut apart. Wow. You know, people have did to throw these that, challenges But did us. they come up with that objection that I've just said? Did they say, okay, so you're making this 20, in 20% 20 of the time. What am I going to do for the, re what am I gonna do for the rest of my time? No, but that would it's have been... It's a very it, negative response. It's a very negative response. I, I, I think... The UK supply chain doesn't think in that way. I think the UK supply chain thinks, wow, I've got 50% capacity, I'm going to fill that up. But you can also fill it up with parts you can machine 50% faster, so you're effectively twice as fast yeah. over, a, I mean, over when, a year. When you, look at, and, and, uh, when you look at the speed of these machines, talk to us. Well, do you know anything about jerk rate, Tom? 
Not really. Okay, so <laughs> Lee, just explain to us about acceleration jerk rate, how important it is, because it, it's, it's huge, isn't it? It's very important, and people talk about feed rates. So let's say you're in a small pocket. You've got to start from zero feed rate, get up to your programmed feed rates. You've got to slow down for corners, etc., etc. So acceleration and jerk go hand in hand, and it's the ability to get from zero up to speed and back down to speed. So the more small movements you've got, the more this comes into play. People don't consider this. They just think, oh, it's got this speed, it's got that feed. There's a lot more depth you need to go into, into the power requirements, into, this, into the acceleration and jerk requirements, and really look at how fast can you produce that part. A bit like a drag racing car, is it? Getting up to top speed as, up to quick, as quick as possible. And back down again. Okay. And when we go back down in speed, we use that kinetic energy we produce to decelerate to drive the machine. Okay, so savings in, uh, in, in efficiency For sure. as part of that. Um, when you're moving so quickly, does that have an effect on the build of the machine and the mechanics and everything that goes with it? You imagine that car that's accelerating really fast, that everything that's in it has got, to, has got to keep up and then it's got to slow down again as quick. Is there any knock-on impact as a result of being so quick? Of course there is. So this is why our designers, when they were set to task on this machine, took all those factors into consideration. We talked at length about the spindle. Every feature of the machine has that depth of, 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 um, of technology in it. So that, that the, the, the uh, finite element analysis of, 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 of the structure um, in dynamic mode, not just static mode, the, the materials we use for the base, we, we use a, like a polymer material that, that's extremely absorbent to vibration, uh, but it's also extremely resistant to thermal behavior the, the wide bridge the wide rails the big rails the type of rails every, everything's designed on this machine for speed rigidity and ultimately the the, the the fastest machining time possible and to make parts accurately um for sure. and, and of course that is uh, what everybody desires and needs um work holding on a machine like this let's touch on this one um briefly how do you go about putting your fixtures on here your tombstones um is it a messy process is it quick is it secure tell us about that we talked about the tool chip interface at the start of this discussion it's just as important when you look the other way from the component back into the machine so we, we start with the tables we make our own tables we manufacture tables to less than half the tolerance i think it's a vdi tolerance for for machine tables we don't work to that, we work to our own tolerances. We grind the top surface of tables. So when you put a fixture on a table, you've got a perfect location. Now you can use a, a manually operated clamp, but more often these days, people are moving to hydraulic clamping systems. So there are various ways we do this, but you can have a system where we've, we've got up to 13 ports, hydraulic and, and pneumatic combined, to control um, the clamping of workpieces and to control and make sure that workpieces are actually loaded properly and in the fixtures properly. And even on the, the mill turn centres where we can rotate at 900 revs, we've still got direct control of that clamping process e even when high speed turning. Because if you were to, uh, Tom, when you look at um, having uh, work holding and fixturing and hydraulic things on on machines for me in got days gone by i always associate loads of hoses and pipes everywhere and you know um but that's not the case on here you can see it's right through the center isn't it lee it's a, it, it's completely hose free it's hose free, free. it all comes through the through the table so there's a there's a connecting mechanism through the center of the table that the fixture just drops onto automatically um, sealed and, and with programmable port ports. So, for example, if you have a, a component you need to rough very, very heavily, but the component is likely to distort, you can clamp it hard to rough. You can then release the pressure of those clamps so you're clamping it lighter to finish. So you you're tuning out any any potential distortion, and it's all program it's all programmable through M codes. And, and could MC. you have seen risks with that when you were clamping parts and putting fixtures on tables 
there is risk to machinists, isn't there, if you don't have some of the securities in the process that Lee's talking about? Oh, yeah, because it's all right having your part clamped correctly, but if you're heavy roughing, you can, you can end up moving your fixture. So if your fixture's not secure or it's just not right, then it's, it's, it's never going to work. And has that ever happened to you? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but there's just one quick point I want to say about this machine as well, which is another thing that's really clever. Like obviously, we, we think of fix, um, clamping and stuff. There's hoses everywhere. So you, you could fixture something. All the hoses, yep, that's fine. As soon as you hear it, it, it flies off. But with this machine, it's actually got sensors to show that if the fixture isn't correctly clamped, it won't let you run it. So it's even got the safety features on it as well, which yeah. could help some people. Absolutely, I could have you helped you when you when you don't when want to you talk about accident, it, which we won't talk about. Go on, Lee. Go on. Just, just just one more point on that. When turning, you've also got an a, an imbalance function on the machine as well. So if, if for any reason there was a, a, a you know an, an unbalanced component or an unbalanced fixture. The machine tells you it stops it tells you what weight to put where and you're away okay incredible um just another aspect of the technology available on this compact range from hecate uh um now i just want to talk about two things together uh because i think that, that there is there is um synergy in them these are multitasking machines uh, they have the ability to be automated as we see here with a twin pallet or even a gantry system um, you can have FMS systems on them so you can really keep them running lights out but with that there are certain things that you have to consider there are um, the tooling element there is swarf evacuation there is control over the process it's easy to just go right okay I'm gonna add an, another 10 pallets to a machine but but what else have you got to consider and what does the Hecate machine give you to enable you to run on man successfully well for a start all of the machines are um, a twin pallet so they're all automated anyway we do we do a an option on this compact range um, called the L range where we remove a pallet so that the machines can be connected to an overhead gantry system but that's an automated system anyway so as a standalone they're automated with twin pallets what we then do in many cases is we link to um, a palletized FMS type system or we can link to a robot, we can link multiple machines to a single robot. It really depends on customer requirements, volumes, mix um, and how much money people want to spend. Um, what about sister tooling? What about making sure that when I go home and press the button, if there is an issue, it moves on to the next job the next tool the next you know yep. it factors in all of those things factors in all those things so as a, as a standard um the machines are available with 40 up to over 400 tool holders depending on the configuration so again these are the discussions we have to have with customers early doors on top of that then depending on the workload and and, and how the how the system is programmed if you like there's a cell controller usually on an fms that will say, okay, I want to make 10 of those, 10 of those, 10 of those. It'll look ahead, it'll say, okay, I've got the tools or I haven't got the tools. Um, it'll, it'll look at sister tools and it'll make sure it's got sufficient capacity within the machine to, uh, you know, to run through a weekend or a, a bank holiday or, or whatever they want to run un unmanned. And you've got tool inspection, you've got part inspection, you've got all of those uh options that come with with or can come with the machine everything so so i mean no, normally on a machine like this you would you would set the tool off the machine maybe have a, a chip system like a valve chip system or similar or a coding system so that the operator doesn't have to punch numbers into the machine it's all automatically transferred like you say you've got your tool management system you can probe components before you start to make sure they're in the right place or or that if they're a casting that they're the right size casting there's adaptive machining systems to make sure you're not wasting your time cutting fresh air. You can measure on the machine. You can cut, measure, cut. There's, 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 there's virtually nothing you, 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 you can't do. Um, there's, there's two more points we're going to cover and then we're going to... Can gonna I just jump in yeah, just course, before we start? Just on the, obviously, on the process integration with this machine. Now, I spoke with Lee a bit yesterday about what this machine can do and how it can help. So, obviously, sometimes in a, in a job shop, you've got to turn apart, you've got the mill apart, but then you've got to grind apart. But on this machine, you can do all that in one go. And, and like Lee was just saying, you can actually mill, turn, grind, and then you can measure the part and go, oh, wait a minute, that bore's undersized. And the machine will automatically alter, re-grind it, 
So you, so you know when you when you're talking about lights out machining, you you don't want to set set your jobs running and then come back, set them running on a Friday, come back Monday morning and go, well that bore's out, that, I've got to remachine it. The the machine will, will make sure that when you you well you'll have the confidence in the machine that when you leave on a, on a Friday and come back on a Monday that all your parts will be to size because the machine will have checked them for you. And also with with the checking system, sometimes you you make a part. You're then going to take it off. You've then got to go and CMM it. But then, if you're doing a bore to micron tolerance, you've then got to get that back on machine and clock that part back up, absolutely spot on. This machine does it for you. And with with it not going from machine to machine, like we've said before, that's less human error. Because let's be honest, if a machine ever goes wrong, it's never the machine. It's always the person who's programmed it. And I don't like to say that because I'm a machinist and I'm never wrong. But mm -hmm. We're always there. So just having that confidence in when I come in on a Monday morning, oh, no, are them parts going to be scrap? Are they going to be undersized? No, you've got the confidence with the machine and with all the safety features it's got to go. When I come back in, I'll have, if you've got a part, you'll have two parts completely finished, ready for the customer. Yeah, yeah. so, 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 so important. Um, and a big aspect of everything to do with the compact range that we're talking about here from Hecate. Um, now, I just want to, just two, two very quick points that we're going to touch on, Lee, and there will be more detailed videos on our YouTube channel um, about every aspect that we've discussed, plus more. Um, the HMI, the control system, uh, operator friendly, a great from a maintenance perspective, just explain briefly uh, how good your interface is. Again, this is a new, relatively new interface. It's a flat screen, twin screen configuration, I suppose you could say. I mean, I have a twin screen on my desk at home and I'm working on one side on one job and on the other side I've got some other information. It's just the same. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you're looking at the, the data that you would see on any other control system to control the machine. Behind that, there's also... Um, specific Hecat functionality, very easy maintenance, operating, setting systems options and you can either use the right hand side of your screen as we have been doing yesterday to show the camera inside the machine, we can pull setup sheets, we can pull maintenance instructions, you can push industry four instructions down to the, the operators and, and the shop floor so it's a real interactive user system and we've got several of these in the UK now and the operators absolutely love them and they can you can come here to the Nick and Innovation Centre and see this machine and uh, kind of touch and feel and have a play with um, what Lee's talking about um, guys I know we've probably got a million and one things we could continue to talk about on this podcast I want to just summarise um, what we've discussed and talk about the fact that this compact range is about having a bigger machine in a smaller footprint isn't it you've got a lot of capacity in this horizontal um, machining centre, horizontal five axis, when you consider the footprint of it compared to what the working area is, that's one of the big aspects too. Sure it is, so, so what, one, one of the objectives from our existing customer base was to say, make the machine smaller. So uh, hence the reason we've called it the compact range, but within the inside of the machine, we've lost nothing. We've still got very good uh, axis strokes for the size of the machine. And as we've said, we've got lots and lots of different uh, modules to configure the machine so it's optimized for specific processes. Um, I think the really important thing, the really important message for people when they buy machines is don't look at the just the cost of the machine, look at the total cost of ownership of the machine, look forwards five years, ten years, twenty years as to what you're going to make from the machine, not just the cost. Having said that though, our designers have designed this in such a way that it is a very competitive machine. You get a lot of value for money and it's not really a lot difference in price than other lesser machines on the market so yep. that's going to be interesting going forward as to how many calls we get for these machines um, and it's definitely worth getting in contact with the guys um, from Starag about this machine there's a few points I would conclude with that I've picked up in, our, in my two days with Lee uh, utilising technology like we've got behind us will help you win more work that's a very clear message it will help you make parts consistently to a quality that your customers will like. Um, it will improve your productivity. And if you look at the cost of ownership with the things like efficiencies and cost savings and, and you know, uptime, this machine could be a solution for you. Uh, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Uh, 
thank you for joining us both Tom thank you for your input Lee uh, it's been a great couple of days with you uh, contact Lee Scott direct uh, all his colleagues we'll put some details um, in the uh, on whatever social channel you're watching this on so you can contact the guys if you want to know more about the compact range from Hecat. thank you very much guys and that's it for this MTD CC podcast thank you very much thank you, thank you. For listening to the MTD podcast. If you found value in this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. Find more episodes on mtdcnc.com.